All right, guys, so the first question that we're gonna dive into today was from a user and he says, do you like using Vaseline or lotion prior to using the air pump and do you reapply it after each pump before going in again? So that is like the one thing that I don't like about using an air pump is that it frequently does require lotion, especially depending on what size cylinder you have. This is gonna sound like really weird and I'm sure a lot of people are gonna be like, how is this even possible? But I very rarely use any kind of lubrication. If anything, I actually rely on like my like D actually being like drier so it doesn't actually like stick to the edges of the pump. And because it's like drier, it just kind of slides. I know it's kind of it's kind of hard and it sounds weird, but there are occasions when I have used. Basically, I just use like a water-based lubricant in the rare occasions when I need it. But I don't use. I like coconut oil is a good one because it's like rich with actually vitamin E. So if you do like use it for lubrication, it's actually good for skin as well. So, but no, I don't use lubricant or anything like that. Do you use a heat wrap? And if so, which do you think is best? I'm not going to turn this into promo because it's not available in Leviathan Sups yet. But I actually do uh, use a very generic heat pad the only time i use it personally is to actually like heat up my pump before i use it because that glass gets cold especially in the winter time i do not use it while i'm pumping i'm gonna make a whole video i already have the script done i haven't recorded it yet about heat but one of the things that i have noticed is that when i use heat while i'm pumping the edema i get is like ungodly and i absolutely freaking hate it I use it enough to get warmed up. I don't like using a heat pad after that. Best or personal routine you believe in. So most of the guys know by now that like on this channel alone, I have like my manual stretches guide. Then I have like my whole pumping playlist. Like nothing has really changed in that regard as far as what I recommend. So like just check that out. There's free material there. And of course, guys, like my course is live where I literally break down my exact routine, the science behind it, like how to do it in the most time efficient and simple manner. That's really easy to use, easy to follow. So of course, link is in the description if you want to check that out and go into more detail otherwise either of those other like videos and playlists will tell you exactly what I do tips and tricks well guys I actually have a whole pumping video on like tips and tricks so I'm just gonna you know put a card up here and leave a Cali if you would leave a link in the description for that does it matter if your air pump tube is glass pros and cons no I don't think it matters because I've used like everything from a hydro pump that's basically plastic based and I primarily use an air pump now that is glass based if you guys are looking for a pump, they are available on peakmalephysique.com. Link is in the description if you want one, if you don't have one, whatever. But I don't think it makes a difference whatsoever as long as you have something that is not going to break, um, is high quality, it doesn't hurt, it's not going to pinch, and it can cause a pretty uniform pressure distribution. I, I certainly don't think it matters as far as what is going to gain more because honestly, pressure is pressure or negative pressure is negative pressure. So guys, what we're doing today is that I started my own subreddit, r slash Hink, because many of you, like, I kind of have had a, a breakaway Away from from getting bigger and it's a great platform I started there but it just was becoming too much for me I wanted to have a smaller intimate community that being said guys r slash Hink is about to go private so probably by the time this video airs or shortly thereafter I'm gonna give it about 24 hours and then it's gonna be a completely private subreddit okay that's gonna limit trolls I think it's gonna increase interactions and make it a more intimate intimate community with in-depth discussion so if you want to join me there like this is a QA that I posted up there because I had my first thousand subscribers we're almost at like 1500 at this point so I love the support you guys are throwing my way but I wanted to to do this as a thank you for especially those first guys joining the subreddit all right, so the next question is, many on Thunder's Place and Matter of Size remember the importance of remaining in an extended state with a sleeve after PE. And they say plastic surgeons practice this all the time with skin graphing and it's a proven medical procedure to permanently stretch the skin. The logic is that if your tissue heals in an extended state, you simply have more tissue to your penile tissue, basically. Will the gain, and the gains will come quickly. What do you think? Thanks for your question, man. Personally, I am not in favor of healing in an extended state. Number one, I haven't seen any really anecdotal evidence that you're going to say to to grow faster healing in an extended state number two i think that any additional kind of pe or any intentional like any additional tension on your d is going to potentially increase your risk of like damaging the tissue and even if you have additional like pressure on your lymphatic systems from wearing like a sleeve for example i think that could potentially lead to issues like, I, do I think it's fine? Like, yeah, I think it's fine. Do I personally think it's going to accelerate gains? No. Do I think it personally adds a little bit of additional risk? I do. I'm not going to, certainly not going to try to tell you what to do, but it's not something I would personally recommend. So the next question is the science of hypoxia slash clamping. Do a science video on what happens when the tissues, when you restrict blood flow. Well, I actually do have, like, even recently I posted a video on, like, 
it was talking largely about like fibrosis now, PDE5 inhibitors can prevent that. But when you have hypoxia, like there are certain pathways that are induced. There's, there's like good and bad things that can be gained from hypoxia. And I actually do have a whole video on this coming, so I'm gonna leave this answer short. But there are bad things like literally the, the signal for fibrosis is literally released when you are in an ischemic state or a hype. So ischemia, guys, is just a state of basically restricted oxygenated blood, more or less. If you have a heart attack and it's because your artery and your heart gets blocked or a stroke because your artery and your head gets stroked, those are called like an ischemic stroke or an ischemic heart attack, okay? Just so you guys know some basic medical information. But I digress. There are also some studies, which I'm gonna talk about, which show that like if you can induce a temporary ischemic state and then release it, you can actually like train the tissue to, in a nutshell, be healthier. There's pros and cons. Personally, I try to avoid an ischemic state, just kind of in general, but I do think that there is some merit to it, so I will make a whole video for you, okay? So next question, Hink, please make a video about using heat or not. I know you're biased against heat, but it seems many people reap results from the use is dangerous or not. Does it help with tunica relaxation in order to reach strain rate easier? I promise guys, I promise I have a video on heat coming. I'm, I'm so grateful for you guys for asking me these questions and wanting me to make these videos. Seriously, it's wonderful. I think heat has its use. I just, I, I personally think like of all the PE stuff, maybe not all of it, but I think like heat is one of the most overrated things that you could use in general. I also think that heat when used incorrectly is more dangerous than people appreciate that it is. Yes, it can induce like a sooner relaxation. Like, yes, it has measurable benefits when it comes to like actual like collagen stretching, but just stay tuned for the video. So final answer is I do not focus on heat. I use like warm water or like warm heat wrap. I don't crank it up. I certainly don't use anything like IR. The medical evidence, in my opinion, is not particularly suggestive of a true benefit, but we'll get to it. So here's a really good question. I really like this one, okay? So thoughts on glands expansion slash growth. So for those of you who don't know, the glands is essentially like the head of your penis, okay? Is tissue actually different from the rest of the D and growth is dependent on time under tension? I've attempted to find sources on this and I haven't been able to come up with much. So the, the underside of your actual like shaft, okay? That it's actually one piece that essentially goes like all the way almost from your like anus all the way up and all the way informs actually the glands of your penis, okay? So your corpus spongiosum leads into your glands. And then you have the corpus cavernosum on either side. The difference is, is that you have dramatically less thinner tunica when it comes to like your corpus spongiosum and your glands. In theory, most people should see accelerated gains in not only their glands, but also their corpus spongiosum when it comes to actually doing PE because that tunica is thinner. So for me personally, like if you were to, if I stand up and I look down at my D, it, I mean, it absolutely does look wider. I mean, it's significantly wider, but compared to like the changes from the underside when looking at my corpus spongiosum, like that thing is like tripled in size and that's largely what's responsible for my increase in girth. I think that there is definitely a difference in the tissue and I personally think you should see accelerated gains when it comes to the corpus spongiosum in particular. For me personally, I have also seen pretty significant difference in like the actual size of my glands. And I also think that's a large portion of where uh, my gains have come from. However, a large part of that is also improving my EQ or my erection quality because like I was Kegling and I certainly had a hypertonic pelvic floor before I started this and I had, I was already kind of predisposed to my glands not filling up completely. If you guys haven't seen my video on soft gland syndrome, you should check that out. But now that I have improved that, I've improved my pelvic floor health that has allowed for better blood flow, better filling out of my glands and much better size as a result. So here's another great question, okay? What can guys who get cold source take instead of Vigor? So Vigor, guys, it's my citrulline-based supplement. It always sells out because, quite honestly, it's so damn good for what it's designed for, which is maximizing erection health, maximizing endothelial health, helping you recover from PE. It is in stock now, guys. It's on Amazon, especially depending on what region you are. If you're in Europe, it's probably not going to be on Amazon. Sorry, guys, we're working on it. But Vigor, check it out if you're interested. But what he's saying is, basically, what can you use instead of a citrulline-based supplement? So for those of you that don't know, I'm going to try to make this concise, but basically arginine, so the active ingredient that forms like nitric oxide, 
is one of the things that is needed in the virus replication pathway when you're talking about herpes simplex 1 or herpes simplex 2. So either oral herpes or genital herpes. Whether you use actually just L-arginine or whether you use citrulline, which actually gets converted to arginine in a more efficient manner so you have more available, it can make people predisposed to have cold sores, okay? However, I think I think most guys with either type of herpes don't actually get that much of a cold sore breakout because I know several people with cold sores that use basically vigor, literally vigor every day, okay? That being said, if you wanna get a nitric oxide boost, something like, honestly, just beetroot, just beetroot extract is a very good nitric oxide boosting supplement that is not going to go down that arginine pathway. That'd certainly be something you could consider. But quite honestly, man, I would actually give some sort of citrulline based product a try and see if that actually causes a breakout. It probably is not going to, just so you know. But great question. So here's an, I mean, I guess these are all, these are all great questions because they're on my subreddit. I mean, they're, they're, they're all good questions though. So I wanna hear your new experiences with the air pump. How has the air pump changed your routine? So quite simply, I used to basically water pump seven days a week, okay? Now I water pump maybe two days a week. The other thing that has changed with my air pump is because it's so convenient, I have shifted to shorter routines and doing it twice a day. That is like actually a major paradigm shift for me is that I will try to do at least like 15 minutes in the morning and at least like 15 minutes in the evening. I absolutely cannot say that it has accelerated my gains. It's too early to say that. I haven't been doing it that long. I absolutely continue to gain though. And I do think there's merits to doing it twice a day, but that's probably a whole nother video. If you guys want me to make a whole video on basically pumping routines and like what I would recommend, let me know in the comments, okay? Um, but because it's so easy and honestly, like there's something about seeing that gauge tick and I can see exactly what the pressure is that is just so gosh darn reassuring to me that like I just feel so much better about pumping in general as far as the safety. So am I doing more water pimping or more air pumping or still using a water pump? It's, it's air almost like all the time. I do and still enjoy the water pump, but it's, it's almost exclusively air now. Do I find a difference in the pressure types? Now this is kind of a loaded question because the short answer is no. Certainly as far as gains, if anything, switching to an air pump has kind of rekindled my gains or like re-accelerated my gains. Cause I do, I don't know if it's just mental guys, we're talking about such infinitesimally small numbers and I know I'm kind of contradicting myself on this, but I do feel like I kind of plateaued and then I started incorporating air pumping and I don't know whether it was um, because I went from air pumping then I started going like twice a day, but it's hard to say. Bottom line is I don't think if you're using it either one appropriately, I don't think either one is kind of like better. I do feel like I get a better uniform pressure distribution with the water pump, but the air pump is just, it's just so much easier. Like it's, it's almost hard for me to go water pump because like I have to like wait for the water to get up, like warm, like fill up the water pump, take off my clothes, like get into the shower, apply the pump, like squirt the water out. And then like I have to dry off afterwards and then like, oh, time for a new set. Got to fill up the pump. It's just like, it's so inconvenient that the, the convenience has led to more use and more time under tension. Like for that reason alone, I think air pumping is a little bit better personally. And I definitely think it's safer. So. So yeah, there is that. Once again, guys, if you need a pump, peakmalephysique.com, that's literally the pump I use, but I'm not trying to just like hawk a bunch of crap at you guys. It's just a high quality product and it's cheaper than you're gonna find otherwise. Have I played around with shorter interval sets? So uh, I personally, I don't like short sets. So like my routine is more or less, like I will do a warm up set of maybe like two minutes and another warm up set of like two minutes. And then I will do sets of like five to seven minutes. I personally like the longer sets just because even with just using an air pump, it's annoying for me to like decompress and then like pump it back up and like decompress. I'd rather, it's just, it's just more work. It's more like friction almost. Um, I'm not saying that like doing those intervals is better or worse or whatever. It's just, for me, it's not as good just because it requires more, more work and more attention. I like more of like a set it and forget it type of thing. Okay. All right, guys. So this, this next one is a long one. So I'm, I'm not, I'm going to give you like the spark notes version because I don't want to, it would take me a long time to read it. 
Bottom line is this dude has had very unfortunate luck and actually ended up basically breaking his neck, had a spinal fusion, and as a result, some of like the innervation, like going to his penis and pelvic floor has been off, and he's had multiple episodes of like what we call ischemic priapism, where you have basically an erection for so long that it actually like you you don't have oxygenated blood in your penis and it can lead to major major problems as a result he now has what we call soft gland syndrome guys i made a whole video on soft gland syndrome and he basically asked for my help regarding soft gland syndrome bro this is like a really complicated case and i'm good at a lot of things but i'm never going to try to tell you that like i know more than a urologist and i'm sure you've seen several urologists in this the one thing i would recommend is definitely getting an ultrasound done you know you have to be very careful especially with your proclivity to having ischemic priapism but ideally an erection induced priapism so you can see if there's any like like vascular dysfunction either venous leak or arterial blocks that are preventing the actual corpus spongiosum from filling up completely um, if you're not doing any kind of pelvic floor stretching I would certainly recommend you do pelvic floor stretching because that bulbo spongiosus muscle that lies like right over top of the corpus spongiosum if it's too tight it doesn't allow the blood flow in you can have soft gland syndrome that way but you certainly especially just with the neurologic features alone man like that's a bit out of my pay grade and I would love to lie to you and, and I wouldn't love to but like honestly I think if you were to sign up for my patreon and we were to have a more dis in-depth discussion I don't know how much I would be able to help you because like quite honestly this is this is a bit out of my pay grade i hope this helps man please watch that video on soft gland syndrome and i certainly wish you the best all right so here's another one i've always wondered about the genetic differences between tunica elasticity and thickness so basically could an ultrasound measure tunica thickness like arterial wall thickness and there's any other way to correlate flexibility with pe or other studies related to aneurysm to other tissue elasticity so yeah, me and Perv actually had a pretty in-depth conversation. I gotta bring him back on here, guys. If you guys wanna get like Perv McSwerve back on the live stream, let me know in the comments, but I really enjoyed that and learned a lot. I believe there are ways to measure the tunica, and if you guys know in the comments like the, like the specific study, but it is hard. I know a lot of the studies looking at actual tunica thickness have literally been on dissected cadavers. I don't think there's like a very reliable way, like even like MRIs, I don't think they're so in-depth. You can be like, okay, let me count the layers of tunica here. I just don't think we have that technology yet. I do think that there is, there's certainly measures, I mean, even just kind of testing your, your stretch flaccid, for example, or if you're a grower or a shower, I mean, that is directly related to the amount of elastin content in your like actual tunica. Typically guys that are growers have high amounts of elastin, it like stretches out, but then comes back where guys that have lower levels of elastin have more of like just a consistent hang where they're actually flaccid size is more consistent with their actual rect size. That is something me, me and uh, Perv talked about some things like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome where you actually have, or like Marfan syndrome where you actually have these like collagen forming disorders where you have like hyperflexibility. The bottom line is, I'm pontificating here. Bottom line is, I don't have any clear studies to directly correlate that. I think that obviously PE is more like aortic aneurysms as far as the tunica like dilates, and that's what we see in things like megalophallus. But I don't, I can't think of anything that I could correlate with like, oh, if if you can put your hands flat on the ground when you touch your toes, then like you, you're going to grow faster with PE. I, I don't necessarily think that coordinates so or correlates rather. Sorry, man, that was kind of a bad answer. So here's a very important question that comes up way more than you think. Can you do PE with mild hard flaccid? Bottom line is, can you do it? Yes. Do I know people that have hard flaccid that do it? Yes. Would I ever do that? Absolutely F no. I mean, personally, and I'm not trying to like make you feel bad or anything. I would just do everything I could to get my hard flaccid corrected before I would consider doing anything enlargement based. And it's kind of like I say all the time, guys, like I would rather somebody try to take like 5,000 milligrams of citrulline and or like Cialis to try to get like the hardest direction they could to see what size potential they would have if they just had perfect erectile quality and then see if they would still even need to do PE because most of them wouldn't. So most people with hard flaccid, a component of that is typically erectile dysfunction. I think there's a lot of things that you can do in PE that would make things a lot worse. Bottom line is, I would not do it. Can you do it? Yes. Second to last question, if PE is causing an aortic aneurysm, like you're saying, can you rupture it? 
Um, so the thing is, guys, I, like I made a paper about like the collagen stress, like especially if you are pumping, like literally as you pump those tissues, they actually get more adept at hang at handling the higher pressures. Like actually the more PE you do, the lower your risk of rupture is going to be. No, I don't think you're going to actually like rupture your like your tunica of your penis because as it dilates, new collagen is formed and like the bonds fill in. Yeah, I don't, I don't think you're at, at risk of, of doing that. And even those guys with like literal megalophallus where like all of a sudden their like tunica dilates to like literally like seven inches in those like journal articles. If you guys haven't seen my megalophallus video, you should check it out. But basically they've had corrective surgery and it's not like they were like, oh yeah, the tunica was like up on the urge, like on the verge of like rupturing or having a penile fracture. They were just like, oh yeah, it's definitely dilated, but intact. All right, guys, and the last question. So is pumping for 10 minute max rule based on just getting super hard again to maximize growth and or as a safety concern, I know you promote three sets of five to seven minutes. Pumping for 10 minutes to me, it's not like a safety concern as much as you start just to develop edema. In my opinion, anything approaching seven minutes or later is at a much higher risk of edema. Do I think it's safe to pump for 10 minutes at a time? Like, yeah, I just think you're much likely to get out of the tube and have like a big bloated member that is probably not ideal. Guys, I love you guys sincerely. I really appreciate you. Join me on r slash hink if you want to participate in QA sessions like this. That is essentially the only place you can find me outside of YouTube right now. Guys, just remember there's nothing wrong with self-improvement, but you are enough just as you are. Catch you in the next one, guys. Peace and love.